Book Interrupted has been nominated for a People's Choice Podcast Award. www.podcastawards.com We can be found under the leisure section. We'd like to thank our fans for all your support. You've thought about joining a book club, but there's one problem. You're too busy, or buying books aren't in your budget, or some books aren't in the format that you can access, or you lose interest before you can finish, or maybe you have no interest in reading the book. Whatever the reason, there is a book club for that. Here at Book Interrupted, reading the book is not a prerequisite for joining the conversation. It's about connecting and celebrating life's interruptions. Join the community by following us on Facebook or contact us through our website at www.bookinterrupted.com fans. We'd love to hear from you. Parental guidance is recommended because this episode has mature topics and strong language. Here are some moments you can look forward to during this episode of Book Interrupted. Shame about his journey or his existence, like his identity. I just, it makes me so mad. You still get to learn, but you're learning through someone else's emotions and views and stories and stuff. You know, and villains do bad things. And there you go. There's your boxes. Don't come out of them. So you just don't really hear about that, especially with big authors. They don't necessarily like join. Yeah, it's like the difference between explaining to somebody how a strawberry tastes and letting them eat a strawberry. My body has Information is the goal. Trying to learn something new. Without being disrupted. My body and soul. Information is the goal. Trying to learn something new. Without being disrupted. Mind, body, and soul. Welcome to Book Interrupted, a book club for busy people to connect and one that celebrates life's interruptions. If you'd like to join along, this book cycle is from September 12th to October 17th. It's Kim's book pick, and we're reading From the Ashes by Jesse Thistle. From the Ashes is a memoir that exposes what it means to live surrounded by prejudice and racism, and how to find happiness despite the odds. Let's listen in to this episode's group discussion. I think um, it's really important because it's a it's a book and it's a biography or mm -hmm. an autobiography. That's one that you tell yourself, um, right? Autobiography. Yeah. By virtue of the media through which it's delivered, you can fall into like just engaging with the character. But it's his real life. And you're like, this is fucking yeah. real. Like and No, and, that's a thing. You're yeah. like, oh, and you root for this main character, right? As he goes through, and I'm sure there was moments in his life where he just felt shame about his journey or his existence, like his identity. I just, it makes me so mad. You know, another thing he does that I thought was really great in the book, and it makes me think of how this whole binary of good and bad, all the people in his life within the book, he doesn't paint them bad or good. Every person's textured. So when they do something that's not that you might say is bad, you don't hate them. You're just like, oh, why did, why did you do that? It's really humanizing. Yes. It so much me... more in line exactly with the human condition. Those are the moments and the people that really impact us. It's not when things are clean and things are very like this way or that way. It's when we have to hold those paradoxes within us. And yeah, even like what we spoke on, I think with like nonviolent communication to like even view an abuser is also a human. It's way easier. I want to label them a villain, you know, and villains do bad things. And there you go. There's your boxes. Don't come out of them that you couldn't pigeonhole it and say, uh, yeah, just like what you said, Sarah, the texture of the people and that they're neither good nor bad and that they can make poor and good choices and have poor and good behavior. It's like the same thing real as, life. The race, as the race binary. Yeah. Right? How we learned, you know, it's not good or bad. There's probably some racism that you got I want to say by accident, but probably fully on purpose. Yeah. Like, like there's some <laughs> racism that you got and it doesn't mean that you're bad. There's some characters in this book who make some choices that hurt him. And it's not because they're bad people. It's because they're people having an experience and part of their story is that as well. And it goes back to that interconnectedness too, eh? You see someone who you might at the shallowest level describe as a villain because they do something that might hurt the main character. But then you're 
brought to the web of that person and how did they get there and all of the things that were connected to create that situation and you're gain, like able to gain empathy and and understanding and then you want to advocate for everyone yeah i find that uh well i've only read the bits that i i think his dad is a villain right now but maybe it gets more humanizing i'm sure <laughs> But I also like in each of the chapters or the little stories, he ends it on a way where you're like, oh, I want to know more. And then he goes on to something kind of different. I think this is such a refreshing book for me since doing this podcast, because we've done a lot of like intense, you know, me and I'm not huge into the self-help kind of books. And I, this is nice because you still get to learn, but you're learning through someone else's emotions and views and stories and stuff. And so this, this to me is more my kind of book than some of the other ones because I find I learn more when I hear other people's stories than if you just tell me the facts so thanks Kim for picking this book because I'm excited to finish it and read it no problem I feel I feel special with Lindsay likes my book Lindsay because you are a writer are you finding it interesting to read his book because it is somewhat new or different from the way we are conditioned as readers to like i found that with untamed um mind you untamed of course came with like the side of a lesson but i appreciated it because here's someone who's just trying a new format like sure they are an author and they're writing but they're playing around with it did you appreciate um, yeah i mean i don't think this is i don't think he rewrote I don't know, what's that saying? Reinvented the wheel or something? No, like it's, okay. yeah, I think it's still just a narrative, a, a memoir, a story. Okay. Like, okay. Yeah, so it's not any different, but I I'm, I am enjoying it. You know, I, I, you definitely feel for the characters and feel what it's like to be that, you know, what is he, a four-year-old boy and his father is, you know, not left them no food and they're trying to figure out what to eat and his brother has to go into the garbage can to to find some food for them to eat that kind of stuff you really feel what it would be like to be that kid so far i'm really enjoying his writing style i find it interesting in contrast to untamed because many of i won't i guess i'll say us i didn't point this out originally but i I don't deny it observed that untamed was a memoir, but also felt self-helpy because there was that little chunk of advice or the Mm -hmm. lesson was always like summarized at the end. Like, and that's how I learned this. And that's how I learned that. And this storyteller is only offering the truth and it's up to the listener to learn the lesson. And it's a little less presumptuous. And at the risk of stereotyping, I'll go out on this limb and say it's very indigenous because storytelling is major. And so I like to see the difference between, you know, a privileged white author telling her story and then an indigenous person telling his story. And I feel like I can observe all of these. Again, I don't have the language. There's nuances. It's it's like magical. It's intangible. It's the storytelling of the storyteller that draws the reader along and the, the learner or the listener to pull from it. It's almost like when you summarize and package up the lesson, you rob the listener or the learner of the experience of capturing the lesson. This author is not doing that. He's just using truth. In this case, sometimes the stories are not full truth, but they're still told in ways to help you discover truths or whatever, but he's just telling a story and it's just so much more meaningful almost than someone who wants to also report on, you know, how many lessons they learned. Or I don't know. I don't know. Yes. I don't want to, I don't want to make Glennon sound terrible, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like the difference between explaining to somebody how a strawberry tastes and letting them eat a strawberry. Right. There's a big difference between ex- going through the experience, like figuring it all out yourself and, and what it means. That's what I hated about. Well, I didn't hate about, but I disliked about Untamed. Strongly disliked. <laughs> That's what I kept saying. I was like, stop telling me, show me, show me how, you know, show me through your stories, you know, how you got there. And I really think that he's so far, I've only read the bit, but ha- is really doing that. He's just showing you. I don't know, maybe he is telling you the story, but do you know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> yeah, he's sharing. He's just sharing an experience. He's sharing. There we go. Sharing. Yes, exactly. It makes me think of something I learned in an Indigenous Studies course that said that elders would tell stories 
two children. They didn't tell the children the moral of the story. They let each individual find the moral of the story within the story to take with them on their journey. They don't say, and this is the lesson, <laughs> right? And some of the storybooks I have for my kids that are indigenous, they leave it open-ended. So then it kind of opens it up to my kids being like, so does that mean this and this and, you know what I mean? So then they're more engaged in saying what that story of, you know, the raven meant. The, oh, so that means that I shouldn't do this, or it means that the raven learned this. So I think that maybe in the book, it's kind of what he's doing, right? He's telling the truth, telling the story, and letting the reader get the moral or the lesson from that by just engaging in the story, rather than being told, and this is what I learned, and this is what you should learn from this. Yeah, yeah. well, I love that distinction between showing and not telling. It's so in line with even the roots of theater and oral storytelling tradition, like a good playwright and director and cast and crew are going to show and not tell. And when you tell what you want the lesson to be, you rob the audience of the opportunity to reflect. The reflection is key because the reflection allows you to then find you've been presented with someone's subjective truth. And in order to, ref once you reflect, you tap into your own meaning making, which are your own truths and neither are absolute truths. That's that beautiful, magical moment when you disrupt something in your brain and in your heart when you can find new meaning. This interruption is brought to you by Unpublished. Do you want to know more about the members and Book Interrupted? Go behind the scenes? Visit our website at www.bookinterrupted.com. Book Interrupted. This is the best possible interruption. Family coming to visit. And one of the best parts is that I'm meeting somebody new, my brother's girlfriend. And because of that, I know that my mom's going to want me to make an extra effort on the house. So I kind of have a bit of a to-do list of things that I've been meaning to get around to, like some holes that needed to be patched and making the spare bedroom look a little bit nicer. Uh, so busy doing that. And it's wonderful. It's, it actually feels nicer in here. Plus... Even better is spending time with family. Book interrupted. So what do you guys think about the title? Like my story of being Métis, homeless, and finding my way home, and it's From the Ashes. Is it just obvious? Does anyone have anything to say? I like From the Ashes. The idea that Me too. his life was burnt down and that he rises kind of like a phoenix or something. That's what I get from it. Something like that. I like the part of finding my way home because of the... I don't know, symbolic journey of his movement. Well, from, I guess, not really understanding his heritage and culture and then his movement away from his heritage and culture and then his return, finding his way home to be able to come full circle, I guess, and now really embrace and thrive. There is something I was thinking about that, that just reminded me was the word homeless, I think, says a lot more than we think it does because it's not just that these people don't have a house or a place to live is that they've lost their home you know home is more than just a building and it's a sense of connection to a place or people or you know a culture or something like that and so homeless is there's more to it than not having a place to stay and I think that's what kind of makes it even more complicated. Some people think, well, just put this building up and the homeless can stay there. It's more than just not having a building to stay in. There's more to it than that. I was reading some interviews about the homeless situation locally. Sometimes cities take down homeless camps and stuff, but the camp isn't just, they're like, well, they can just go in the shelters, but there's a sense of community there, having the same place that you can go to every day and the same people there. And I mean, obviously with this book, this, his, him becoming homeless wasn't just not having a, a building, but the whole loss of his um, connection with his culture, I guess. Mayor, you're sense. like blowing my mind. You're right. That is a heavily late, is that the right term? Heavily laden term, homeless. I never even thought of it. I was like, of course, it's like symbolically, it. there's like way too many layers 
in there. They're lost. Mm -hmm. They've lost themselves. They've lost that sense of identity, identity and dignity. Like Often. I'm sick of the way people look at homeless people as if they are subhuman. Well, and then fixing the problem isn't just a matter of, uh, okay, check, we got some buildings. It's solved. Yeah. But that's really? not the, it, it's way more complicated than that. And uh, I'm really looking forward to reading this book. I think you're right with the sense of community, Mary, because now that I think about it, when you think of homeless shelters, it turns out to be a competition because you need to get to the homeless shelter at a certain time. So you get a bed and then, you know what I mean? So now instead of a sense of community with other people who are also homeless, like you were saying, uh, in camps, now that they they take the camp down and now they're competing for the same bed at a homeless shelter then all of a sudden no longer that sense of community anymore it's turned it into instead of community competition it's just counterintuitive to like you know people need a support system and other homeless people are their support system because they can relate to them where people who aren't within the system maybe not sometimes sometimes i know that a lot of homeless people don't want to go to the shelter yeah. because the shelter is just a crammed space of everything that is negative about the homeless experience well that's the thing about the community i mean there may be some kind of camaraderie or community but it's almost like a dog eat dog kind of thing oh, and okay. if the bylaw is not pushing you on people are stealing your stuff for sure it could be worse than that too it depends on what you have of value you're you could be threatened you don't feel safe and the shelter to someone who doesn't experience homelessness looks like a good solution but hearing from homeless populations it's good for if it's too cold right like it's good for if that's what i need so i don't die then I'll go there. But if I can do something else and not die, then I'm gonna do that. One of the things that bothered me the most that I didn't even realize until it kind of got brought to my awareness is how cities were changing their infrastructure so that you couldn't like sleep on a bench. That's why the benches have a handle in the middle. So like a long bench, I can sit on this side, you can sit on that side, it's divided by a handle because then someone can't lie on it. Oh. That to me was like, what? They, oh, they don't have anything. Let's even take away this, you know, like... Why are we putting out resources towards making our marginalized populations uh, lives more difficult rather than taking our, our energy and resources to helping? And the whole needs thing, just giving a shelter doesn't fulfill the that kind of that list of human needs that we talked about in the last, in uh, nonviolent communication. Warmth and food and water and stuff is necessary, but that sense of autonomy and community and connection that is also so important also yeah. yeah just even support groups to help them deal with the shame they're picking up on signposts all over the place from their cities saying we don't want you here and kim to your point even in the kitchener waterloo area they're making it so that the urban development is pushing a migration so that they're coming out of waterloo because heaven forbid they should be in uptown Waterloo, which is very nice, then pushing into downtown Kitchener. But then there was too many complaints. So then pushing through Cambridge. And now the big migrational push is to get all of them in, I think it's Brantford. So they're changing the urban development in a way to make it so that they're forcing people that are homeless to move so that they'll all end up in one designated place so that they aren't upsetting our eyeballs. That's right. What That's what I think that shelters are for is so yeah. that the people who have discomfort at seeing whatever you want to label a homeless person's experience as can go get in that building and then I can have a good conscience now. Um, in Toronto, they've been near um, my house, not this house, but the house in Toronto. They've actually built recently two different apartment buildings where it's their own room and like a bathroom and, you know, it's like they're small and, but it's for um, getting people off the streets so they can have their own space and their own home. And uh, there's one just for women and children and then one for everybody, which is great. But then at the same time, there's a park right near us in which 
since the pandemic started, there were a lot of tents. So we had like kind of a tent city in the park and it was fine. They were kind of out of the way and everybody was fine with it. Um, but the police just, I just saw it on the news recently, went, put up things and like kicked them all out. And so now not only like they all had a community and a home and they were happy. They did. I don't think they want, they didn't feel shame. They were just like, this is my home now in my community. And they were called the white squirrel brigade i think but the police just went in and like fully raided it and put up fences and tore everything down and were really really it was really bad anyways it was uh, a lot of people were really really upset there were protests and stuff but that was just by my house as well so i'm not saying that toronto is great but toronto is trying to do some things i think to help so that people don't have to go to the shelters and they have their own space and their own yeah, I think more stuff. and more there's a there's something being built near my mom's place and they're converting an old hotel and it'll be you know individual homes like basically a little bachelor apartment mm -hmm. and then there'll be a common area as well and resources in the same place all the same place so I don't know people yeah, get which makes way more it, sense than like a bunch awesome. of cots in a in a big room in which people you know can't don't even have their own space like they have to wait you know each day to be able to get a bed that's stupid yeah you can have your own space that's amazing I, like i read something so i'm not an expert on this or whatever but i did read something that said instead of having uh projects or sections of cities for people who are poor or in social assistance or whatever it's been proven if you integrate them into different communities then they are more likely to not need social assistance within a shorter amount of time they get out of the system and there was a huge number of people who got out of the system just being being in an integrated community, instead of being like, these people need to be over here and we're over here. When you integrate them, it makes a better community for the people who need it. Anyway, I, I read it somewhere and I don't have any facts, so it's not very helpful, but- well, It kind of um, touches on the point that I was gonna say, which is there's a lot of uproar, like we need to get more housing and like, let's help everybody. And then when it comes time to pick a location, there's this whole like, well, not, no, not- Not my backyard. Yeah, yeah, not here, not here. <laughs> And so that's kind of in line with what you're saying there, Sarah, is that, you know, it can't just be for optics and it can't just be to make yourself feel more comfortable. It's supposed to be to help the most vulnerable. Like it's supposed to be, yeah. you know. Well, the ones that are like that's... near us had a sign that this is what it's going to be used for. You know, they're, they're, the two places are different spots in my neighborhood. And you know, I guess nobody complained because they went up and they're great and people are moving in and. So I feel like that makes more sense, you know, because there are people, oh, homeless yeah. people in our neighborhood. So then now they have a home and um, part of the community already. Yeah. And now they're yeah. even more so being welcomed in. As opposed to pushing, like Kara said, them yeah. out of the city. So people, yeah. I don't know. There's two terms that people use. One's uh, NIMBY and YIMBY. So if somebody calls you a NIMBY, that's a uh, not in my backyard. Okay. And YIMBY is yes in my backyard. So there's, yeah. you know, people say yes in my backyard. Let's, let's help the people who are vulnerable or help everybody but, out in the yeah. community. But I do have to say that none of us are experts, so don't, uh, you know, what made me think of in the, I think it was the book, the skin I am in. I think it's that book. I'm not sure hundred percent. Anyway, in New York, they had, you know, white upper-class families. Like we need to have a school that integrates all children from all economic backgrounds and races. And they pushed it and pushed it for years. And then when they went to do it, none of them sent their kids there. Is that All the podcast, Nice White Parents? I think it was from The Skin I'm In. I oh, think okay. so. But it might have been from White Fragility. I can't remember now. But I feel like it's from Becoming. No? Oh, maybe. It could you, be. You know you read too many books, Way. <laughs> <laughs> this is funny to hear you. I read this somewhere. <laughs> Damn Just it. look at my book show. <laughs> um, but yeah, it could be Becoming. But that's the thing. Like Very wealthy, upper class, white people in Manhattan were like, we need to do this. We need to do this. I think it was Manhattan. It was on in New York anyway. And oh, when no. it came time to send their kids, not one of them did. When they went back and researched it, nobody actually sent their kids there. They all, you know, they thought that other people would and no one did. So they did the school after years of fighting for it. And then people might be saying, yes, my backyard. And then they start building in their community. And then all of a sudden they're like, I got the move. Maybe yeah. I'm going to move. Yeah. Or whatever. Right. So this makes me think when Lindsay was like, they put a plaque there and everything was fine, which is great. But it makes me why they have to be like these are the people oh no it wasn't a plaque it's like so before an announcement so anyone could say like what's going up 
So anyone could NIMBY. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's like, you know, they have a building permit. Like you have to have a building permit outside. So it's a big, you have to say, this is what this is for. It didn't say this is for homeless people. Like I think it said, we supported how it was something like that. And so people could, if you have any issues, call this number or whatever. It's uh, hard so to because this is, uh, I, don't, I don't know how this is going to interrelate because it kind of goes to individualism, but that feels counterintuitive. There isn't one fix for like all homeless people aren't exactly the same with the same needs and problems. Right. right so, right. Um, because there's some supported housing in the city that I work in. So it's great because I know that one of the main things like, I like, I want to be able to lock my door. I have some privacy, right? Like those things are obviously important, but also there are people are like, I don't want to live there because, you know, people are yelling down the hall every night or someone's knocking on my door for drugs because they forgot which room the dealer lives in or whatever, right? It can be disruptive and traumatic to people anyway. So it's almost like, I don't want to knock it. Of course, it's important and very necessary. But at the same time, it's almost like that minimum effort. I don't know, maybe it's the cheapest mm. way to do it. Or, you know, what I mean, well, I guess the cheapest way would be like, let everybody sleep in every park. But I feel like there's still this lack of acknowledgement of individual needs or something. Yeah, they can't all be painted with the same yeah. brush, right? right? Like, it's the same thing where like, we can, people get categorized if you're not part of the, uh, the dominant uh, group. And it's going to be, there's a multi-layered, um, it's got to be multi-layered solutions because you're, you're looking at different yeah. people that have different needs. Yeah, yeah. I get what you're saying. Yeah. That let's not kid ourselves in thinking that when we offer cookie cutter solutions, that it's going to be the beat all that end all. Yeah. So there's just more to be done always. I don't know. I mean, for me too, it's like homelessness or the homelessness problem is literally the symptom of capitalism. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know if that's actually the, the disease, but something like that, right? There are layers and layers and generations and generations of things that like led to this, right? For example, what about, I don't even remember when it was, maybe the eighties or the nineties, they're like, we're, un, we're not going to fund mental health facilities anymore. Like that's one of the beginning. Are you issues. kidding me? They you don't know that? about this? Yes. There was no. a massive, massive shutting down of institutions. Essentially they were changing the framework of mental health support. I don't even know, but it was obviously about money. It's always about money. Always and about they, money. They changed the the formula. And so what it, what the result was lots of people who were receiving support in those ways were now left to fend for themselves. There weren't facilities to support people with significant mental health needs. Some people who like won't take their meds because their meds have a thousand negative side effects in a facility, like, like institutionalized people, right? There's no institutions now. There's no places where someone who's really, really, I don't know, sick with schizophrenia who needs someone to make sure they take their meds every day. Otherwise, they're not going to take them because of the side effects. And they live in a safe, like, that doesn't exist anymore. That used to be a thing. Like, there was a point in time not too long ago when there was a mass defunding of mental health. And it resulted in the release of many, many people from residential settings where they received treatment just into homelessness because they don't have the skills for everyday living that this society requires for someone to experience independence and so yeah and that's like that's what my understanding of the significant homelessness issue yeah. is because of a lack of resources and a removal of resources and the story at the time may have been at least something that could be perceived as positive, right? Because hindsight's 2020. Now here we are and it's like, oh, yeah, look at this big problem, right? But when they were making these changes, it was probably, you know, we need better mental health. You know, we're going to we're gonna change it okay. so that you don't live there and you get outpatient. Like, who knows? It That's still exists my though. Like my mom was a psychiatric nurse for her whole career. So they, mm -hmm. they still have for- Yeah, I think they're localized to be out of certain yeah. hospitals. Like a wing in the hospital, a though, right? Program, isn't no, it? She, I, yeah, like she worked at the Hamilton, used to be called HPH, the Hamilton Psychiatric Hospital. But now it's, I think it's part of another hospital, but it's still its own building and stuff. Like it's still a whole section where people that are extremely, extremely mentally ill will live there per permanently. And there's permanent staff and nurses. And so, yes, yeah, so it does exist. 
I think that it was more of a defunding, you know, so, and there may have been a, a bar lowering, you know, you have to be really, really bad. Just, you know, because yeah. I mean? we don't have the beds for that person who formerly could have stayed here. Right. So people in the know, middle yeah. kind of aren't getting treated. So people that who need the most treatment are getting treated. People who need the least still are because they can go into whatever they put in the meantime, right? Counseling or other programs. Also, I mean, some people just don't want to, you know, reading Sapiens and stuff and how, you know, these rules that were created, or I watched that movie, it was a nomad um, that won the Oscar, I think, recently. Anyways, why do we all also need to fit into this idea of having a, a home that you have, you know, like, if you want to be a, someone that moves around and stuff, that must be really difficult for, so maybe someone who's considered homeless is just someone who is happy I don't know, you know moving that. around and not having a, a one place to stay because they don't want to stay one place. I don't know. Yeah, that's there's like a, probably a difference it. between wanting it, right? And then yeah. n- not wanting it and just having it anyway. Right. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. that's what like, it's hard. it was hard for those people too to live in our society because we have created Judgments. this society that's one way is the right way yeah you know and so. you must and consume you need stuff yes. where's your house where's your yeah 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 exactly but I'll, yeah i also know that and maybe it's changed but i do know there was someone in our lives that um and being homeless and one of the things he said was the problem is he needs he can't get social assistance because he needs an address. So he became homeless and now he's like spiraling out of control because he can't, he doesn't have an address and he doesn't have, he doesn't have the resources that our society needs and the government to provide him with the funds he needs to be able to obtain a new apartment or a new home. This is ridiculous. Or find a new place. Yeah. And so he, he had a lot of trouble. And I know that like we co-signed something for him and help try to help him out because he was in this like vacuum of like, I can't, I have, now I'm in homeless shelters and stuff and I can't seem to make it work because now I've been evicted and now I'm homeless and I can't proceed the way I have proceeded in the past. So um, I think there's definitely flaws in the system because there's there's some people, yeah, like Kim said, like, if you don't want to be, sometimes you're in the system and it's like, all of a sudden you're spiraling down and you're like, I don't know how to stop this trajectory mm-hmm. that I'm going into. And then again, yeah, you're right. And then people steal from you. And then all of the year and you're afraid and you're in dangerous situations and you don't know, luckily yeah. we had- And then how had would us. they even apply for jobs? Like in today's day and age, like so much of it is done electronically. Like what are they supposed to, oh, let me just open up my MacBook here. Like there's so many little things now that I think about it that maybe we do take for granted or aren't always aware of that would be major obstacles or hurdles for people who are homeless. Well, here's a good one. We, um, in my agency, work to house people. They're supported and then we are pursuing housing. And many of the people that I come into contact with are low income. And so there is a temporary rental subsidy grant or something. There's some money that you could get to help someone with their income so that they could secure okay so i don't know about the rest of the country but for sure in bc there is a rental crisis we literally are dealing with like a zero percent vacancy rate anyway so even if someone was by the grace of god homeless but full of resources to like there are people that are going to go to homelessness because their landlord's selling well this isn't fair either there's people like families that are like we need somewhere to go and there's nowhere to go the levels of homelessness are from my mental health is so bad that i can't even do the day-to-day tasks of life to you know accomplish things that this society requires to like I'm a family of four and my landlord is moving into this house so now we have nowhere to go anyways back to this rental supplement the people that want to apply for it are trying to leave my program which is a temporary program but they can't apply for it until they secure their housing and so it's like I can't secure this housing if I don't know if I can get this grant like I can't sign up say my budget's 800 a month everything is minimum 12 so I need to know that I can get this $400 subsidy I'm not going to sign up for a $1,200 a month apartment and then go through whatever bureaucratic 
timeline of trying to get a, approved for this subsidy and then find out I'm actually not eligible. So it's just a, like that's locked right in there. Like, okay, so damned if I do, damned if I don't. Cause I, they can't use the temporary address of staying at my program for the application they need to have like they need to have housing and then they can apply for the subsidy so I'm, I'm i'm assuming that the subsidy might be someone who's experiencing a temporary difficulty it may not be actually meant for someone who is trying to go from homelessness to being housed but for the fact that their income and the waiting list too so you can apply for bc housing so you there's two streams you can go for supported housing which is low low barrier you don't have to be substance free like whatever and and you can have some it's just literally an option for homelessness or you can apply for subsidized housing or low income housing the wait list for supported housing is two years and the wait list for low income is more than four so and those are the options right? If you're actually someone like- Those aren't options. No, exactly. They're not. They're, what they are is reflections of the need of like re supports and places and, you know, and there, there just isn't enough. Yeah. Well, when you say it out loud, Kim, <laughs> it kind of makes you think like, pretty why aren't other people putting this together? That's why it's really, really- chat like it's a very complicated issue well and then not just that but so then there's a landlord who you know interviewing people for their place and there's you know 60 people who have applied and the ones who are waiting to see if they're going to get a subsidy might default so well, they wouldn't even be able to wait because they haven't yet got the house so they're right? not even yeah they're not even right? on the list it's just but also landlords would discriminate against those. It's like, oh, what do you, how do you pay your rent? Or what's your job? And you're like, I don't have Some, a job. Oh, how do you pay your rent? I'm on disability. And then they're like, oh, okay, well, don't want you. I remember when I was renting, I had to bring, get a letter from my employer. You Some know discriminate saying. against if you have kids, like nobody with an animal, you know, yeah. like, and that's not even, you know, I mean, I guess like kids and an animal, those are choices, you know, some things are not a choice <laughs> and you get discriminated against for that. It's just crazy. And then first and last one's like, I know here you can get, have, there's houses where there's upstairs, downstairs, just two floors, mm -hmm. a single apartment. So you're looking at a hundred or a thousand square feet or 1200 square feet. And they might be going for 1800, 2000 a month. I mean, prices like that, number one, you're never going to be able to afford to buy a house if you're renting at that. And then you're house poor and renting and you've got half a house, you know, but it's very competitive um, getting into the rental market. So, mm -hmm. I mean, what do you do? It it's not funny, but I remember when I moved to BC uh, the second time, usually my MO for moving would be go on Kijiji and see the lists of availability and you scroll and you're like, well, this looks nice. That looks nice, whatever. Right. And I was able to move from Ontario to Alberta in this way, never seeing a property, never actually meeting my landlord, just having a conversation and making an agreement. And there we go. When I tried to do the same thing, I was so naive from Alberta to BC, I was scrolling the, I was trying to scroll the lists of things that are available. And all it was, was filled with people being like, please, I have a week left. I need something. Right. And there was nothing being like offered this, but this was the section of offered, but people had gone into the offered section just to beg. And it was just pages and pages of people being like, I need, I need. And I was like, well, I guess like when we moved here, we had to live in three different places in one year just to find the place that worked luckily. And that was still really lucky. And um, the first place that we lived in was like what Meredith's describing, so expensive that we were only there to buy ourselves however much time it took us to get the heck out of there because we were slowly like digging ourselves a huge debt hole just so that we weren't living in a hotel. So, and that's, I'm privileged. <laughs> that's my experience. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. can you imagine if you have any under, you know, like, so there's something it's broken wrong system. with capitalism. It goes yeah. back to the individualism and what Mayor is saying, right? Like if you can buy a house because you'll never have a problem with that, rent it, sell it, whatever. It's all a crazy, crazy thing. But if you can't, then too bad for you. Then too but bad. The rich, the rich will just get richer on your back. Yeah. yeah. And not even that, because I have a different perspective being here. Even if you buy a house in Canada, we also knew someone who was a senior citizen and she was in her 80s and she lived in Toronto and lived in that house her whole life. 
it was her parents and she inherited it and she could no longer afford the taxes on it on her old age pension and was being forced to sell and move her house because she couldn't afford the property tax, tax on her own house she had to she had no choice that's another thing which is nice here when you own your house you just own your house like no one's taking your house there's no property tax there's nobody coming knocking on your door if you secured land and built your house it's just yours and your family forever and yeah like there's people who here have half built houses but and they're living there and like they've built in they're slowly building and there's no one being like you're not by law you need to finish it by this time it's just like oh you had a trouble and are struggling and can't finish the house because you ran no problem do it next year yeah, like, just take longer right it's fine <laughs> but this is very clear between the different societies because our canadian society is very capitalistic so it's like no progress progress you need to keep on going put the money in yeah and victing people like it's kind of heartless is what it is mm -hmm. you know it's not about people it's about money Right? Yeah, in a way, haven't we, whether we've consciously done it or subconsciously done it or just unconsciously done it, it is we, all of our systems are bureaucratic and that doesn't allow you to have heartstrings to attach to anyone because you do one component and then you pass it along. Like we, in our capitalist society, we have inadvertently built these mechanisms and structures and systems that don't allow for the human heart to come out. And it's a lot easier to stomach at the end of the day when we can say, well, you know, I can't help it. That's just, it's the way the system is. And I'm just so sorry. It allows us to sleep at night is what it does. And it allows us to feel like we get a good citizen badge because we have things like, well, we have social assistance. We're, we're good people. Like, are we? I don't know. We don't seem to be doing a lot of things. And I'm not trying to like, again, compartmentalize or not say that people don't have good intentions or whatever. But if we really wanted to help people, I think we would start to do a massive review of how are our system set up mechanically? What are the processes? Uh, we would start to allow pockets so that one human can connect in with another human and that we don't just offer band-aid solutions. Does anybody know anything about different places where they've done different strategies for supporting their homeless populations? Yeah, like, is there Norway where that's doing something differently? And I think I heard a report of success. I know, I think you're right, Kim. I heard something too. And when you said Norway, kind of- Yeah, like, I don't Denmark, know- Denmark, maybe? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, like there's somewhere. a thing called Google. I'm gonna Google, Google. it. Oh, you're okay, the researcher, good. Lindsay, get her All research, you. talk because amongst yourselves. There was and something it had... where it was like a community and it was literally to house the homeless and then their homelessness rate or whatever the calculation is, was zero because they accomplished their goal. And I'm just curious to find out where that was and what exactly there the was something yeah I, statement. I, I heard um, something about that too i'm very quickly google searching but that uh finland has been tackling homelessness successfully Holy. the latest figures from the end of 2017 show that there were about 6600 people classified without a home in all of finland and that was that article was from the bbc in 2019 there is a story here saying that veteran homelessness functionally ended in London, Ontario. So veterans, that's not that bad. That's a start. But there's also an organization called, it says, Beginning the End of Homelessness, homelessness in Canada. Built for Zero Canada is an ambitious national change effort helping a core group of leading communities to end chronic homelessness. So I bet they have tons of information for all of us who want to learn more about the, the hey, issues. Maybe we can. Yeah, it does say Helsinki uh, in Finland. The headline from the BCB is the city with no homeless on its streets. And oh, that's so that Helsinki. might be it. But I don't think they actually have zero homeless from what I can read. Part of that, I don't know, but part of that is also going to come down to with personal preference, uh, like Kim was saying. I don't know. I'd have to read the whole article. That's all I have to say right now. All right. We'll Obviously, put it in the show notes. learn a little bit more. Yes. Yeah. yeah, for sure. We'll so the, I guess to bring it back to the book, it's good that we're at least having the conversation because I think that in true discomfort 
causing form. It would be something that maybe you don't want to talk about the homelessness problem or an experience of homelessness or anything else. And through his storytelling, Jesse Thistle has now cracked that one open, at least on this podcast. That's right. I love that. I love this podcast. Thank you, Sarah, for making it and for everybody for doing this specifically because I have now talked about more to- different topics out loud and in the public, really, than I ever have. And I think that's great. I think I, I feel more comfortable talking about them. And I'm just really appreciative of everybody who's all of you who are part of it and Leah, who's not here to make me feel comfortable about talking about these things. And then I'm hoping that our listeners will then have those conversations with their family and friends, pay it forward, I guess, in a way. Yeah, yeah I agree. I like yeah. that. I, I, when we first did the podcast, that wasn't my intention, but I, I, that's another reason I really like it because it is, I feel the same way I'm talking about and educating myself more about things that I might've cared about on the surface. But now yeah. I'm like deep diving into because of the podcast. Yeah, it's been it's been a good experience for me. Yeah, I think it helps too when you're doing a deep dive to have other people to talk about these things with. So many of the things you talk about are so big, and it's hard to get your mind your mind around it and figure out how you feel. Or I mean, it's just like all the you know like the homelessness problem. It's so big. And there's not going to be just one solution, right? And trying to understand all that. It's easier when you have somebody to talk to about it. Yeah, better form your thoughts or get even like bits of inspiration or new perspectives on things. I'm going to be wondering about your homeless word and the connotations around that for like a good few days, Meredith. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. And to all the trolls out there that that write things, what did that one troll say? There's nothing worse than white women who think they know everything. We don't think we know everything. We don't even, we're not experts. For anyone who wants to think that we're trying to be experts, we're not. We're just a bunch of women trying to have a conversation about these topics. We're stumbling Um, forward. We're stumbling forward. So trolls, stop sending us those damn messages. (laughs) Leah will be disappointed. (laughs) Yeah, true. (laughs) You love the trolls. Just to bring up why Leah's not here, uh, Leah had an injury, but she will be back uh, hopefully on our next one, hopefully. And we'll be funnier when Leah's here. It'll be way funnier when she gets back. (laughs) And she's doing well, Kara? She's doing so much better, yes. Good. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Book Interrupted. If you'd like to see the video highlights from this episode, please go to our YouTube channel, Book Interrupted. You can also find our videos on www.bookinterrupted.com. Moments you can look forward to on next week's Book Interrupted. Or when someone else makes a joke. She always like, it's so good because she'll say things like, nailed it! So I will say something positive about Glennon Doyle. She doesn't send me hate mail. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's just another reflection of the shitty way that Indigenous people have been treated the entire history of Canada. Sad isn't even the right... Yeah. Word. What's what's worse than sad? You know, like what's bigger yeah. than sad? You know, devastating. Yeah. Yeah. That I was part of the problem. Yes. Because I wasn't part of the solution. Book interrupted. Never forget, every child matters. <laughs>